3, verses 1 through 8. Everything has its time. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to plant, a time to die, excuse me, a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to gain and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. And now Mark will give us some special words. So, boy, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embrace. What a perfect line to take us out of the pandemic, right? Um, so as I mentioned, I want to give a little backstory to kind of how this message got put together. Um, so as I mentioned, I was asked Monday, six days ago, to see if I would preach for today. And Pastor had asked us at staff meeting three hours before, you know, worship design met, and I asked, how prepared do you want me to be? And she said, you don't have to. <laughs> so I said, all right, cool, I can do that. <laughs> but funny enough, before I was asked, Ecclesiastes, the book of Ecclesiastes, came into my life probably a week or two prior about how, you know, its connection and how it's brought people out of, you know, different mental battles and all that. And I'm like, Ecclesiastes? How? I've never heard how Ecclesiastes can do it. I mean, I understand it's a book of wisdom, but it's like, how rarely do you see Ecclesiastes being used as a key scripture? So thinking, okay, what are we doing? I sat with pastor and started thinking, you know, trying to spitball ideas. And it's like, on Independence Day, what if we talked about dependence? And it was one of those cases like, nah, it kind of defeats the purpose for today, doesn't it? But then I realized that we all still share a dependence on time. And that's what we're going to focus on today. Again, we're going to talk about dependence. Now, I know that seems ironic to talk about Independence Day on the day where we celebrate our freedom as a country. But there's still a lot that we depend on in our day-to-day -day lives. Could be people, could be time, could be money, could be, as I've said, my focus for today, time. All of us here, all of us at home, we share the same 24 hours, the same 1,440 minutes, the same 86,400 seconds to do whatever we need to do through the day. Each of us goes through different events, but we still share and depend on that same amount of time. And the passage in Ecclesiastes that Diane read for us today talks about how there is a time for everything. Time for this, time for that. Some of them seemed extreme. Some of them seem obvious. Some of them seem just downright weird. But I think as we can look back over the past 17 months, there have been certain times that have seemed extreme, obvious, and just downright weird. But there was a time for all of that. And this isn't me saying that God created all this for a, created the pandemic and all that. No, 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 no. Don't, don't take words out of my mouth and that word there. But what I am saying is there was a time for us that it needed to happen. And today I'm going to talk about a couple of different themes that came up in the eight verses and see just how dependent on time we make these things. We heard that there's a time to destroy and a time to build. 
Now, to destroy by definition means to put an end to the existence of something by damaging or attacking it. And to build by definition means to either construct something by putting parts or material together or to make it stronger or more intense. In other words, there was a time to end something and a time to start something new or to reinforce what we have. And a lot of that, I feel, is going to happen as we still walk through the end of the pandemic. There's a lot that we've seen ending or that had been destroyed, whether it's businesses, different protocols, routines, rituals. There's a lot that we're starting to see return to normal, like, you know, people going to restaurants and eating or going to the movies or, you know, seeing a face that doesn't have a mask on it. There's a lot that we're seeing that has gotten or are getting stronger because of the destruction it went through. I've had many times where I've had to sit down and think as I've grown closer to reopening our youth and children's ministry, what got destroyed? What do we need to strengthen? What, so, what is something new that we need to do? And this concept of building and destruction is something that we may deal with very regularly but yet we still understand that God gives us as much time as we need to walk through the destruction or the building process. And there are things that we will need to destroy, whether it's habits, relationships, routines, and many other things. There are things that God would like us to destroy or put an end to in a softer term. There are things that we depend on from the world that keeps pushing God out. There are many times where I've relied on people for a variety of things, and as people have given me what I needed, I realized I was pushing God further out. And as I mentioned on graduation Sunday, I'm learning to create a better dependence on God. I feel like I'm in this season of building, of reinforcing what I have, whether it's my relationship with God, my trust in God, or my faith in God. I have learned that the things we depend, depend on in the world can be temporary, but the dependence that we can have on God can and will remain forever. Now, I've ended some of those things I needed to, and notice I said some, because it doesn't happen overnight or in a time period that we want it to. It happens on God's time. And as I said, God gives us enough time. Another thing that we listened to today is we heard that there is a time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to be sad and a time to dance with joy. And there's something I've still struggled with, something I don't know if I've shared. Um, I've talked about, you know, my kind of bad people-pleasing habits, and it kind of falls into the line with that. But what I'm going to discuss is how I do absolutely whatever I can to make everybody happy. I try my best to make sure each person is smiling and happy and not dealing with stuff that all of us deal with. I mean, come on. And I didn't know it until more recently than I, I think I really care to admit how harmful that is. I mean, imagine, and I'm sure a lot of you can agree, it's uncomfortable to sit in a room where somebody's mad, sad, depressed, grieving, you name it, and know that there is just nothing you can do other than your first instinct, try and make them smile. I mean, from in my eyes, Jesus called me to be the light of the world and the light shines over darkness, and so we're called to shine our light into other people's darkness. Sound theology, 101. Didn't even need a degree for that. I'd still say that's not 100% accurate. The thing I've learned is that we need to depend less on toxic positivity, which I encourage you. It's a true term with a long definition that I didn't feel like going into today. But I encourage you to learn about it and see what you take, take away from it. So, but we need to depend less on toxic positivity and depend more on Christ-like love. It's learning not to force positivity, but instead to walk with others through whatever they're feeling. 
It's learning not to try and make good out of a bad situation, but it's to reinforce that I hear you and I see you. It's learning that humor can only get us so far, but instead to reinforce that you are loved and cared for and supported. It's learning that in the silence, when nothing feels right to say, that God's voice speaks the loudest. God wants us to go through the emotions of life and not suppress or not block them from happening. God walks with us when we're sad, when we're happy, when we're angry, when we're anxious, when we're depressed, when we're whatever emotion you want to put in that you're dealing with right now. God wants us to depend on him when we're in our feelings, both good and bad. I mentioned that I used to only go to God when I was struggling. And I realized that while it was good to do that, it was also wrong that I didn't give glory to God in the good. Why? Because I did those good things. I did the good. I didn't do the bad. The world did the bad. I did the good. But unfortunately, that's not how it works. Proverbs 3 mentions how we are to lean on God's understanding and not our own. And God grants me the ability to do the good and the unfortunate free will that he gifted me to causes me to deal with the bad. God is going, going to God through and with all of it, instead of letting just time play things out, is a blessing, more so than I once realized. I don't just have to sit and be impatient when the world's clock doesn't go as quick or as slow as I want it. But instead, it's letting God guide me through it and telling me when to act, when to don't, when, when to not act. God's clock works for the good, even when it feels so slow. And the last thing I want to talk about today is how there is a time to be silent and a time to speak. And I think some of us can agree that there have been many, 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 many controversial things that have happened in the world over the past 17 months that I'm not going to touch but I've often criticized myself for that. I have power, I have authority, I think. I should be voicing my opinions to the message because change is gonna happen. But yet I've also had the converse thought of who am I to talk about these things? I don't know enough about it. I don't wanna speak you know, unknowingly. What if others judge me over my own views? So I keep my mouth shut. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. Some things have come across my way that I know won't work or that I may see it as flawed somehow, but yet still keep my mouth shut because everybody else agrees. Knowing that I would be the only dissenting view, why would I throw fuel on the fire? There are things that I have said that I know I shouldn't have and therefore overstepped my power and my authority and there's still yet a time to speak and a time to stay silent. James teaches us that our tongue is the deadliest weapon we have because of its power to speak life and death. We can uplift someone with the most positive affirmations and love that we can offer. We can tear somebody down with toxic phrasing or negative word choices or slander. We can tear somebody down with toxic positivity like I talked about earlier. We can also tear someone down by sh how showing how, let me say that again. We can tear somebody down by showing how significant others are. So we're lifting others up in our conversation. Yet you've gone and done that same thing that they're lifting up. Yet you're not getting any of the praise. Our tongues have more power than I think we realize. There's plenty of times where I've helped others only to realize that what I was doing or what I was saying was actually hurting the situation and not helping it. Many times people have helped me only to hear it as come, come across my perception as very oversimplistic or very all or nothing. And I have this need for public affirmation. You know, I'll go to people and some of you can probably vouch for this that says, is this good? Or what do you think of this? And believing that if I am right, in their eyes, 
with whatever I believe, with whatever I say, or with whatever I do. That it gives me that affirmation to say, yep, Mark, you're right because they agree with you. And I, again, never realized how damaging this need of affirmation was. I'm dependent on the opinions, insights, compliments, critiques from other people that I've left out the one judge that matters, the almighty judge. And no offense to anybody here, anybody online, I'm not throwing anybody under the bus. Keep your pitchforks under your pews. Well, as I say this, it shouldn't matter what you think of me. What matters is what I can do for God. And if I'm doing it in a way that he has called me to do it, in, in a way that pleases him, that's who I really need to depend on, not you all. And again, and again, keep your pitchforks under the pews. I'm not saying it as a way to be mean. I love you all very dearly, but I'm relating my dependency on the voice of others instead of the voice of God. And as an old phrase says, silence can speak volumes. And whether it's my own silence, or whether it's a crowd silence, silence can say a lot more than we think. And I've been trying to learn this wonderful magic on how to tune the crowd out and tune God in. And it's hard. It's like really hard. They don't teach you that in Sunday school. They need a, like an instruction manual on how to do that. I pictured it a lot like a radio. You know, you're scanning through the stations, trying to see what's available to you nearby, what you want to listen to. And you finally get the one that comes in clearly and hits. And it's like, yes, I got it. That's how it feels to me with God sometimes. We can hear things that sound like God, but really aren't. We can hear things that don't sound like God, but it does actually, it is actually Him. We often need that silence to hear what He's speaking. And there will always be a time to speak and a time to be silent. But that still depends on God's timing. Now, I'm apologizing, even though I don't need to, but I am, if that last part felt all over the place. Ironically, I'm depending on God to sort all that out through the, whatever words I said to your ears and make sure the connection is still there. And I know that's going to happen over time. Thankfully, through the wonderful work Elizabeth does and the many improvements we've made to the sound booth, we can go back and watch it later on Facebook or YouTube. But we know that God always puts things in their path in the time we need them. Like I mentioned, Ecclesiastes only really came to me today, or came to me about actually, and I misspoke earlier, about three days before, hey, you're going to preach. What better timing? And funny enough, too, the memorial I went to yesterday, we were going to do an overnight trip. And I wouldn't have been available for today. But God's timing worked it out. Because of God's timing, I created this message that I depended on him to guide me through. Again, six hours, and I think it took me two hours to write this. I did, because of God's timing, I was able to get the strength to get on stage three weeks after I preached, which, if you haven't noticed, this is the first time in the six years I've been here that I've preached twice in a year. And that was even three weeks apart. <laughs> and the roof is still standing, thank goodness. You may celebrate, crave, want the independence that we celebrate today. And I'm not, die, I'm not knocking the holiday. Please don't take that out of context either. But we will always depend on God. Amen.